WEIRD is an acronym and it stands for Western Educated Industrialized Rich Democratic Countries. Countries like Norway and Germany and France and the United Kingdom and America. One of the core things about WEIRD is that it's not just that they're like people in WEIRD countries and they have these characteristics and they're people in other countries and they have these other characteristics. Is that if you look at psychological characteristics as like a bell curve, there are some characteristics that people in weird countries not only have differently than the other ones, but they have like at the far end of the bell curve, they are the most that thing of any humans we can measure. <laughs> and they're the most weird. One of the core ways that we're weird is that we think we have a self. And by that, I mean, we think we have a fixed set of attributes that are internal and that will be the best reliable predictor of how we behave. Other people in other cultures do not think this, and that suggests that our sense of self is largely culturally constructed. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists, and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political, and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is Sarah Stein Lubrano. Sarah's a writer, content strategist, learning designer, and researcher at Oxford University. Her work focuses on the role of emotion in political communication and specifically on cognitive dissonance. How is it that we know the climate science and politicians are still expanding the hydrocarbon industry and generally making decisions that are not at all aligned with a sustainable future? Well, Sarah explains that the problem is actually our sense of self in Western culture, believing that it is fixed, that it is permanent, that it is unchanging, and the sense of alleged security that that gives it's why it's very difficult for us to change our minds and why our brain would actually rather generate rational excuses to explain behavior that goes against what we know to be true, rather than going through the more difficult process of examining ourselves, changing how we behave, how we think, and therefore who we are. This is such a fascinating conversation. Sarah explains how this is particularly a Western problem, that weird countries create individuals who exhibit rather extreme sets of behaviors. She offers other ways of understanding the self from neurophilosophy, the relationship between our sense of self and death and how that impacts our politics, the ways that we can speak to people that invite them to change their own minds in non-judgmental ways. And finally, the importance of social infrastructure, how by changing the infrastructure with which we live our lives, we can give people access to different groups and to different actions and these are also two of the most effective ways of updating what we think about the world and therefore changing our behavior. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques, and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. My first question is, why is the world in crisis? Well, I, uh, I have almost three degrees in social science. Um, I'm about to finish my PhD with any luck. And so I you know the answer. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Um, and I guess I must say that having heard many arguments about this, I'm profoundly um, convinced by a sort of Marxian response, which is the world is in crisis because our economic system is full of contradictions. And obviously the most mm. clear one when it comes to your podcast is that we are using resources that we cannot replenish on this earth in a way that will lead to not only uh, the eventual economic a downturn of that exact system, but also obviously like life on planet Earth coming to a at least very unpleasant uh, new order. Mm. 
So that, that's yeah. my short answer. Yeah, I have a longer answer about why human psychology like permits this. Yes, please. The long okay. answer. The long answer. <laughs> so the long answer is that I think our minds, uh, this is not just I think, in my research, I see that our minds are extremely, they are navigational tools, let's say, um, for getting us through the world. And in order to do that, they need to make sense of the world and they need to make sense of the role of the individual or at least semi-individual self in that world. So they're always looking for, you know, a story or a map or a set of possible next actions. And in doing so, they require some kind of consistency and con con congruency, let's say. Um, and they, if they can't find it, they fake it. And that means that our, our understanding of the world is often shaped as much by our internal need for consistency as sort of like the external reality. Um, and so what I study specifically is a phenomenon called cognitive dissonance, which is a discomfort that people appear to feel when they notice a contradiction between two or more of their own beliefs or actions. Um, if you've ever like known smoking is bad for you, but grabbed a cigarette at a party and justified it to yourself in some way, like congratulations, that's your cognitive dissonance. And then you've probably found a mm -hmm. cute rationalization to explain why this inconsistency is actually consistent because, oh, well, it's good for me to have friends. So I'm going to go out and smoke with them or. <laughs> you know, um, smokers are classically always saying that it's good for their weight, uh, as though the effects of the smoking wasn't worse on their health than any weight thing, you know. Um, that's a rationalization. The other thing that dissonance seems to do to people because it's uncomfortable and they want to resolve it as quickly as possible is that they choose which sources to give credit to or weight to uh, in order to maintain their worldview often. So that's how we basically filter all news on Twitter. You know, like if somebody I really trust says something on Twitter, I count it in my worldview and usually they're saying something that I already agree with. And if I see a new source say something that says something different, I often will decredit that source in my mind and say, well, that's, well that might be true though. Or they're kind of over the top, aren't they? Um, and all of this is just to maintain our sense that we kind of know what's up in the world, who we are in it, that we're an agent for good and that we have action possibilities in the future available to us, which seems really important. And that makes sense because our brain needs to be thinking about that all the time just to get us through the day. How interesting. This is so timely because, I mean, the cognitive dissonance um, that we're seeing in the world, let alone sort of current geopolitical movements, but in, with regards to the climate crisis, uh, you know, these agreements being made at COP and then expanding fossil fuel production and consumption. Um, and a lot of activists are sort of, and scientists are just screaming and saying, how, how could it be possible? Um, and you're saying this, this is how it's possible that their, I would assume, existing worldview is that the economy can continue growing and that we need to do that, that that is the priority and that some tech will probably come along and, and figure out the fossil fuel conundrum at some future date. Yeah, I think that's roughly right. I mean, again, because I'm a, a grumpy Marxist by profession, <laughs> um, I, I would say I think that the economic system has a logic of its own, mm -hmm. that individual humans struggle to counter i don't want to say we can't counter it but i do think without very uh <laughs> very powerful economic alternatives it's difficult right in the same way that you know you may hate your job but you are still going to it because you don't have other good options and i think a lot of the people in this world are they have any any control you know people who are let's say investing money still in fossil fuels just think well this is all i can do in this system now i obviously don't agree with that but i do think the power of the current economic system is strong. And yeah, then I think the way they rationalize that to themselves, rather than saying this is distressing and I've done something harmful, is they come up with a, a clever way of bringing it across to themselves. You know, like, ah, well, I'm I'm doing both. Later, we'll do this other thing. I'm fine because I've both helped the shareholders and later, I suppose, we'll have some cool carbon sucking robots. Um, <laughs> Which yeah. we can't develop without the money from expanding right. the hydrocarbon industry, right? No, some genius will come up with it, Rachel. It'll be fine. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think it, that's why it's psychologically possible a lot of the time for people to kind of conceptually care about climate change, but actually organize their life a different way because they can come up with clever rationalizations to put away any discomfort that, that generates. Mm, I think flying is another really good e example of that, right? I think it's my it's... biggest cognitive dissonance in a lot of ways in terms of the, the moral, you know, structure of it.
which is that I really care about this thing and I'm deaf flying places and it's yeah. absolutely irrational. Yeah. I had a real moment of clarity flying once um, when I was, am I going to say this on the show? Yeah, I'm going to say it on the show. I was coming back from ayahuasca like immediately because I had to, because I had to go to a conference and I'd taken shrooms to like integrate my ayahuasca message Whoa. <laughs> um, and then gotten on a plane. So I was just, I was just high on shrooms on this plane, essentially. Um, and I was weeping throughout the flight, weeping and weeping and weeping because I felt this sense of like real um, panic and sadness that I was engaging in a suicidal activity. Because I, kn I know how harmful flying is. I know um, the longer that we stick to this maxim of like, oh, it's just my flight. It's just one flight. Like my emissions don't really count. Like that's the same cognitive dissonance. Um, which is expanding this this industry and that I was participating in it and being on mushrooms at that moment really managed to like cut through and it was cut through the cognitive dissonance and I was terrified on the flight. That's super interesting because actually there's some good reasons to think mushrooms would prevent you from doing clever rationalizations basically um, because one of the main triggers for dissonance and with dissonance in particular, the need to immediately sort of get rid of that discomfort is the sense of self. So the sense that like you, Rachel, are one person who must be consistent and have internally good qualities and have new good action possibilities available to her. Um, and when you when we when we when when cognitive dissonance is measured, I wouldn't say we because I'm not a lab scientist nor any other sort of direct researcher on this topic. I am a theorist, which means I read all the literature and try to think about what it means. Um, yeah, the sense of self is a huge trigger. And of course, um, many psychedelics kind of destabilize helpfully and occasionally unhelpfully the sense of self. And they kind of allow us to see for a complicated series of reasons that we don't fully have a self. We're like making it up as we go along. <laughs> so it's, it's very likely that if you hadn't been on those drugs, you would have maybe uh, had less profound sadness about climate change on that plane. Um, now, I'm not suggesting everyone should do ayahuasca, but, uh, you know, it's an interesting thought. Okay, great. Perfect. <laughs> Someone on the show should say it and the other one can sort of <laughs> nod. <laughs> yeah, the, the academic no, <laughs> can, I'll, say I'll just can caveat. I think what's so interesting about what psychedelics can reveal to you um, and lots of other experiences as well is that, as you're saying, your sense of self is not fixed. Because in the West, we really do seem to have this like obsession with the self and we do believe that I am a self and I have a self and it is like inherent and you know some people think it's like eternal as well yeah it, and so you need self. your star sign obviously yeah. and also like maybe your IQ and also a social media profile right because your self is real and definitely not a construct <laughs> yeah let me let me I'll explain why uh as someone who reads a lot about psychology I don't think we have a self and we are probably also not a self um which sounds really wild but there are two two ways of thinking about this and I think they're both helpful um so one is that in the last 20 years or so some psychologists have started doing um, kind of checks to see whether the findings that we find all the time in social psychology and cognitive science in the labs of usually North American universities with undergraduates, like track with anyone else's psychology in the world. And look, lots of things do track, you know, I mean, we there has been a big replication crisis in psychology, but there are things that are true, right, that, that keep being true. People feel disgust, they feel anger, they feel love, you know. Uh, you can measure these weirdly in a lab, et cetera. But um, there are also a kind of core group of findings that don't track when you look at people who do not live in what are called weird countries. So weird is an acronym and it stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic countries. Countries like Norway and Germany and France and the United Kingdom and, you know, whatever, um, and, and America. One of the core things about weird is that it's not just that they're like people in weird countries and they have these characteristics and they're people in other countries and they have these other characteristics is that if you look at psychological characteristics as like a bell curve there are some characteristics that people in weird countries not only have differently than the other ones but they have like at the far end of the bell curve they are the most that thing of any humans we can measure <laughs> and they're the most weird um and the way that we're particularly weird one of the core ways that that 
and I'm saying we because you and I are both from weird countries. Um, one of the core ways that we're weird is that we think we have a self. And by that, I mean, we think we have a fixed set of attributes that are internal and that will be the best reliable predictor of how we behave. And this is uh, firstly not true in the sense that actually one of the better predictors of how people behave is their environment a lot of the time. So, you know, there are like weird people say that if someone steals, it's because they're a bad person uh, rather than because, oh, well, they were in a situation where they really, you know, suddenly were put, there was an opportunity mm -hmm. and they had need and, you know, they're much more likely to rely on an internal explanation for the self, uh, for the behavior of a person and for the sense of self. Mm. Um, and actually that's inaccurate. But also it's just a weird fascination of our weird culture, right? That we think the self is there and it's the best and most likely explanation for human behavior. Um, <laughs> other people in other cultures do not think this. And that suggests that our sense of self is largely culturally constructed, um, or at least very much so. The other reason why I'm... Oh, hang on, hang on. Can I pause you? Can I pause you? Yeah, I'd li please. like to talk a little bit more about these non-weird countries. Yeah. What what is their relationship to self? How does it trend like Sure. I don't know. Yeah, transform. So, yeah. Obviously people still have some sense of self, you know, when they're operating in the world. They have a name, they have a individual identity and so on. But they are less likely to attribute um there's something that in psychology is called the fundamental attribution error, which sounds like a wonderful <laughs> robot, you know, error message or something. <laughs> but it just means that um, human beings, especially weird human beings, tend to fundamentally attribute human behavior uh, to an internal characteristic rather than the circumstances. Like, um, if you've been nice to me, I will be like, Ra Rachel's a nice person. But actually, that's usually not the best explanation for why you're being nice to me. It's usually like, it's beneficial to Rachel to be nice to me, or Rachel's in a good mood, or Rachel just mm -hmm. ate an amazing muffin, you know? <laughs> um, and Western people have this attribution error where they just kind of consistently attribute human behavior to internal fixed characteristics. Um, so people in non-weird countries are much more likely to say like, well, Rachel just ate an amazing muffin, so now she's being really nice. Um, mm. And that's actually great because it also means that later, if you are in fact mean to me, I can now say, oh, Rachel must be out of muffins. We should get her some more muffins. Um, <laughs> instead of... <laughs> I mean, I'm sort of coming up with silly explanations because I don't want to get into, you know, this or that specific thing about you. But but the idea is that actually the fundamental attribution error means that often we are less good at solving problems related to human behavior because we think they're just unfixable, right? Rather, and I think our justice system is a great example of this. Like we think like, oh, this person did a crime. Therefore, they are a criminal forever. They must go yeah. away into a box where their self is kept. Um <laughs> Their broken self. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so I would say non weird cultures would see a lot of individual choices and behaviors as part of an environment rather than like a fixed set of characteristics. And also, they tend to identify more with groups. So, okay. they're less interested in saying, like, I'm Rachel. And they're more interested in saying, like, this is my group of friends. <laughs> oh, this is my and culture. I, I imagine as well that makes it those kinds of cultures a lot more potentially forgiving as well, given like the transient nature of everything. Yeah, and I mean, I don't research that, but I think you could be right in some cases. I think that that, that thing I love about the um, so the example. Oh, Rachel's Rachel's being mean to me. She must be out of muffins. We need to get her some more muffins. <laughs> get her some more muffins. Well, exactly, isn't it? Yeah. There's like an action there that can be yeah. taken to like alleviate the 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 problem that can be fixed by being in relationship. And we're like, you know, somebody else's behavior is also kind of not your responsibility, but impacts you. And thus, how are you going? What actions are you going to take to make that situation better? Yeah. Which is just so out of, um, it would be very out of the ordinary almost in Western culture, apart from in like the most intimate relationships. You know, like if you're um, a woman right. in a heterosexual relationship having a go at, at your man suddenly out the blue, he might bring you a hot water bottle and be like, is it, that be is it because is you it have cramps? That <laughs> it's that noise. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I think only really, or we are or, 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 like, I used to work at the school of life and we would always say that we're good at doing this for children and we're terrible at doing it for anyone else. Like if a child's like, I hate you. We're not like this child is a bad child. Except some bad parents do that actually. But usually yeah. we're like, oh, the child didn't have a nap. The child <laughs> yeah. was sad. Someone was mean to it at school. The child needs a muffin, you know. <laughs> but then we grow up and we like stop doing this imaginative work for the rest of time. It's really sad. <laughs> Because at some point, the assumption becomes that that child who doesn't really know what he wants or what he thinks because he's just a bundle of emotions going through this a crazy experience of learning what it is to be in the world, 
at some point has it all figured out and becomes an adult and knows what it is and what it wants and what he I think we just collapse I think basically imagination is a lot of work it's a lot Mm. of work it's hard thinking is hard and actually uh, I have a chapter in my book that I'm writing that's just about how thinking is actually very difficult and painful a lot of the time it's a huge expensive effort and I think it is easier to think that Rachel is a mean person than that Rachel is a complicated person who sometimes needs muffin. And so mm. uh, we, we often just get stick with the first one, basically. Um, and that is unfortunate because it really limits our ability to do stuff. But why can't we do cases. it so easily for children in most cases? I think, firstly, actually modeling children is a little bit easier, right? Um, like we kind of have a list of five things that we think affect children and it's like naps, friends, food play you know and so i think it's a little bit less scary for us also Mm. like it's not threatening to think oh my child didn't take a nap i mean it might be exhausting but it's not uh it doesn't take too much effort but if i had to model why you are being mean to me as my friend as a grown-up i could be so many things yeah and it's really hard and some of them are kind of scary because they implicate like maybe i did something wrong and you know so i think i think the main reason we can do it for children is that it's not either as exhausting or complicated or scary usually as whatever it needs for us to model grown-up human beings that'll be my guess Mm. okay so that transient self becomes a little bit more complex with every year spent on the planet yeah let's hope so anyway (laughs) i mean that that said obviously most of the time we do just need a nap and some food but um (laughs) (laughs) okay so that was the first that's um, the first reason we maybe shouldn't think about ourselves as selves or having a self Okay. The second one comes from sort of neuroscience and philosophy. And a particularly good book on this is uh, Thomas Metzinger's The Ego Tunnel, which is his popularized work that, that it's written for like curious normies, not normies, curious non-academics um, rather than academics. He has a big, big academic book, but, you know, I think your podcast listeners probably have better stuff to do mostly. Mm-hmm. Um, and his point is that actually, if you look at Well, so basically Metzinger had an out-of-body experience, which sounds like something that only happens when you take ayahuasca um, or whatever. But actually, it happens for lots of reasons. It can happen because you're on anesthesia. It can happen because you're falling asleep. It happens a lot to people who are falling asleep, certain small group of people. Um, And it's basically just that the the brain is actually generating for us our sense of reality. It's not... uh, I think people have this sense that like, ah, we are, you know, we're just receiving reality passively. But if you look at neuroscience, that's not what's happening at all. The brain is, in fact, constantly trying to generate what it thinks is happening, and then it's receiving input from the world, and it's changing that model slightly. Like, we're all in the matrix in the sense that we are generating our sense of reality from a vivid hallucination, roughly. <laughs> um, and without boring you with all that neuroscience, basically what Metzinger points out is that the the only thing that could reasonably be pointed to as ourself is the actual generated hallucination that we're creating or our window out into the world so we might think ah like i'm i'm this is my brain and here's my window into the world and inside my brain is a little man or woman who's sitting there looking out into the world and that's my sense of self that little man or woman but metzinger Mm -hmm. is pointing out that actually not at all there is no one in there nobody is inside the thing that is the self is just this window this generated hallucinatory but like information gathering window out into the world um, and that's true both like a neuroscientific level, but also in a certain sense at a philosophical level, which is that we, we it is this experience of looking out this particular window that is the closest thing we could identify as specific to us, really. Um, and and that's interesting because it also means that if we can change, if we can change what the window is doing, that our mm. self changes too, right? Um, there is, and, and there isn't any other self in there to be changed, let's say. Mm. Mm. Just lots of complex information to be fluid. Yeah, like and, and what changing. it means to be Sarah Stein Lebrano is fundamentally just that I am experiencing this generated sense of the world as it is from this particular perspective. And every once in a while, some weird blip is going to happen and I'm going to maybe have an out-of-body experience. But basically, it's it's that, right? Why can that give people a sense of vertigo? Like, why is it? Why is it uncomfortable to understand that our mm. self, our self is this window? Mm. Well, I a couple of different things. So, firstly, uh, there's like a good bit of research in 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 psychology about how much we fear death, and death is often viewed as the the loss of the self, right? So, I think there's a lot, and this is true with dissonance theory as well. There's a lot of people who figure one of the reasons why dissonance is so hard because it's a revision of the self. If we ever revise our beliefs. And it's pointing to contradictions in ourself, which make it less stable. 
It's just that it feels a little bit like death anytime you notice a contradiction in yourself or a possible loss of self. Like it triggers the same fear of death, possibly. Um, where, you know, we have a, a sort of self-preservation instinct that gets threatened even by this non-literal death that we mm. experience when we change ourselves. Um, and is that particular to weird countries? I don't uh, I don't 100% know, but the attachment to selfhood, probably yes, at least in the way that we do it. I think that's promising, though. Like, I always think about the weird literature. I think when it first came out, some psychologists were like, oh, no. <laughs> because they felt that it made their field of research look bad. And, it, and certainly there are a lot of things about psych research that have been sloppy and non-replicable and bad. And, like, of course, we need to, there's, like, a whole realm of stuff that needs to happen methodologically in social sciences about pre-registration and p-values and constructs and whatever you know that yes but in the long run i actually think the weird literature is great it's fascinating because it means that we can stop talking about like one one human psychology and start talking about like multiple human psychologies and what mm -hmm. they have in common and what they don't have in common and how our environment affects what might seem like our most fundamental structures in there yeah. And also, I mean, it would seem as well that it opens up the pathway to having a better life. Like if you can get over this sort of figurative death by understanding that it is not a death because there was nothing to kill or to die in the first place, then yeah, you can you can adapt. You can you can you can change according to your environment and thus be like a better functioning part of the ecosystem within which you live. You know, Absolutely. like everything yeah. else. Yeah, I think the self is getting in our way a lot of the time. And mm -hmm. I know that sounds very Buddhist, but you can also get there from neuroscience if you want. <laughs> no, I th yeah, I think so too. Um, and I think got this two different directions I want to take us on. So I'm going to flag them both. Great. Um, The second one is going to be embodiment. Uh, but I just want to take a little bit of a detour to Silicon Valley tech dudes with podcasts. Um, okay, great. <laughs> who are like obsessed with their mortality and spending a huge amount of, of money in that part of the world on trying to figure out how to be immortal. There was that guy who was like injecting him or like transfusing his son's, his 18 year old son's blood into him on like a monthly basis or whatever. Um, yeah. This obsession with, 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 with permanence, um, with being fixed, with, with cheating death. In that way, the self is also getting in the way because, like, guys, there's, like, really big collective problems that we need to be working on. Like, you know, the planet is on fire and flooding. Um, people are still living, like, below, below the extreme poverty line. Um, the pitchforks are coming <laughs> for you if you don't do something. Like, uh, there's a yeah. lot going on. Maybe you should stop trying to figure out how to freeze yourself because there won't be a planet to wake up to. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think, in a way one of the ways we could look at all of this huge body of psych literature is that in the process of trying to protect what we perceive to be a real self, but it's actually not, um, lots of other things are lost. And one of the main ones is our ability to handle and explore contradictions in our worldview and revise them such that we have a better understanding of the world mm -hmm. and therefore, for example, respond to climate change. Um, and, and maybe in a way what we're saying is like, I can't die. I can't afford to die. And so maybe the planet has to die instead or, you know, maybe mm -hmm. all these other things have to go wrong so I can preserve my sense of self. Um, and that doesn't mean we don't need any sense of self. We need a self. It's just part of how we navigate the world. There has to be somebody that I feel like I am enough to go boil some eggs and call you on the phone. But, um, but we might need a very different kind of sense of self if we want to be able to navigate the 21st century. I mean, there seems to be a sense of self that is dedicated to life and then a sense of self that is you know, part of the economy of death, to pull a term that Jacques Attali has started um, using. That's nice because, term. isn't it? Yeah. Um, even though he was instrumental, instrumental in creating the economy of death. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, because if, it, because if life is, if life is cyclical in its nature and everything is on the move, it's growing or it's decaying, nothing is ever plateauing, everything is constantly in motion, you know, it's energy, life is energy and energy is always, you know, sort of diffused in, in different ways, um, then having a fixed sense of self, that kind of self that gets in the way of like the collective well-being, i.e., you know, I want to figure out how to make this board, uh, body immortal, I want to figure out how to put my, you know, consciousness in a USB stick, um, right. <laughs> then... That seems least like appealing a... images of life, I can imagine. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Well, exactly. These are all these are all de death images, right? And yeah. if some if something is fixed, normally it's dead. 
Normally, the only fixed state in life is death. death. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot. Basically, I think there's a lot about our underlying psychological fears about death that is getting in the way of our ability to revise our self. And I, I don't do enough cross-cultural research to be sure if there are cultures that handle this better, but it seems like there could be for sure, right? So I guess in a way, without becoming a full-on Buddhist on this podcast, <laughs> I think there's something important there about being able to say, you know, myself is just this weird window and it's going to be a different window tomorrow. And if I notice a contradiction in my worldview uh, and it's uncomfortable, then that's okay. Now, obviously that alone is not enough necessarily to handle dissonance because a lot of dissonance is unconscious uh, or, or sort of pre-conscious stuff. But I think at least knowing this logically might help us catch some of our own contradictions over time. God, I just thought of another contradiction, which would be in the culture as well that is most devoted to a fixed sense of self. Mm -hmm. um, we also have like the highest uh, divorce rates and often oh, like re reasons cited are like, yeah, we grew out of each other or we don't want the same thing anymore. We're not the same people. So it's there. Yeah. Like we have these clues in our in our language. Yeah, we know people change, <laughs> but we're also like not ready for it. <laughs> yeah. We know people change, um, but not the people who have their hands on the levers allegedly sort of making decisions or being driven by sort of economic forces. Like some things can't change, um, but things that don't and change lead to death. Totally. And I think that uh, something you and I have talked about before off this podcast is like that uh, it's very telling that we don't think politicians should be allowed to change their views, right? Mm -hmm. That we're really upset. Like if, if, if even like over something semi-minor, a politician says, actually, I've revised my views. That's really taboo, which is completely nuts. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> what you should want is politicians who are at least somewhat um, shiftable by new information, cooler ideas, uh, changes in the world. Uh, a four hour period to read something, right? You want, you actually want, you should want politicians who at least in some ways can change their mind. But we lose our shit when people, I don't know if you can swear on your podcast, yeah, uh, you yes. know, we lose our minds when people, when people change their views actually in politics. And um, of course, part of that is because a lot of these view changes are engineered for convenience, but we, we should fundamentally have a space for people to change their minds. And I think the fact that we don't is because we have this very artificial sense of self. And, um, we want even like political parties and institutions mm -hmm. to have selves that never change, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. nuts. Mm -hmm. And corporations. And I wonder how much as well that has been since, um, oh, I don't know, like the fact that a corporation is defined as like, a, a you know, has the same legal rights as a person. Um, and then we expect them to have like values and attitudes and all these kinds of things that are unfixing, uh, sorry, unchanging and fixed. I wonder as well if, you know, in these weird countries where... I, Probably one thing that runs through them all, apart from the United States, but it was a colony of the uh, British Empire, was this long history of royalty as well. Mm. And this, you know, ideology that this person, th these line, this line of people is has this like God granted gift to, to rule over. And that sounds pretty yeah. fixed, you know. <laughs> that sounds... but it's very self-oriented and individual yes. oriented, right? Yes. Um, and like the individual <laughs> representing the whole state and all of this stuff. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, so you can kind of trace it back almost to see, and I'm not a historian or anything, I'm just making this up off the top of my head, but like the possible way that we, we tied ourselves in knots along the way to, to getting here um, yeah. and the resulting impact on our culture. Now, I know as well, I want to get you to talk about politics and debate. Um, okay, but just good. But just before we go there, let's, let's yeah. go back slightly to okay. embodiment because there was a sentence you said about 10 minutes ago um, and it was this... The, maybe the relationship that I can't remember exactly, but something that is closest to our self, like the sense of self being the thing that we have that is most real in the world or whatever, like that being a problematic kind of concept. concept. But we have this other thing that is very, very real, right? Which is mm. the body. Yeah. And what we're seeing in um, sort of activist networks is that trying to explain to a person what, a new way of life could be like is really, really difficult. But like inviting them in to live in community for a time or try, tr literally try out a new economic model, a new way of engaging, like embodying the experience is actually sort of the quickest way to make people realize that A, it's feasible and B, they'd quite like it or or not, you know. Um, but we do have this, like it's not just a meat bucket. <laughs> it's, it's this amazing thing that carries us through and allows us to actually engage, actually engage with the world rather than, you know, interpreting it through through the window. And that as well seems to have been sort of vaguely discarded 
um, in weird cultures. Like, oh, like we have a bad relationship with our body potentially. Totally. Well. I mean, the mm-hmm. millennia of religion, which, you know, viewed everything that the body did as like sinful, essentially. Like the soul was the eternal paradise, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing. the Cartesian dualism mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess one thing we could say about this is something I'm very interested in is um, what are called action oriented uh, approaches in psychology. And what that basically means is that certain ways of thinking about psychological issues, including dissonance, but not only, um, understand the brain to be fundamentally generating actions. Um, and of course, at the at the like most fundamental level, it's generating actions for your body, right? Um, one of the ways that one of the ways that this theory came to be is that sometimes when people have strokes, like one of their hands or both of their hands will just start doing tons of random activities mm-hmm. on uh, in a way that the person themselves cannot control. So yeah. you know, you'll have a hand and it will start grabbing everything on the table and maybe even seemingly trying to choke the person <laughs> themselves. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously, that's horrible because it's a, it's a painful form of brain damage, but it's, as it turns out, much of what we learn about the human brain is through brain damage. When you see something has been damaged, you can figure out what it did in the first place. And what it seems like it's pointing to is this idea that what the brain is often doing is immediately identifying all the possible actions it could be taking in the world and then silencing most of them because obviously you can only do one at a time and many of them are stupid. Um, and it may be for this reason, for example, that when you stand on the top of a tall building, some small part of your brain is like, jump, even if you are hopefully not very suicidal. It's not necessarily that you deep down have a destructive tendency, although we all do. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that your brain has identified that that is one action possibility and is like, oh, 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 <laughs> action possibility. Um, and these are called affordances a lot of the time in literature. They're the, the action possibilities afforded to us in our given situation. Um, so yeah, so our brain is probably thinking by constantly automatically generating action affordances for us and then muting most of them so we can get through our life. And that reason that this matters firstly is that it's deeply connected to our body. Um, but also that I think it's important then to think about whether some of the things we've just talked about, including the self, the sense of self itself, dissonance are related to these affordances and some people think so so there's an action-oriented theory of dissonance which is that we mainly experience the discomfort of dissonance when the contradiction in our worldview screws up our ability to generate affordances right and actually some of these affordances might not even be about our body like if i uh you know think the patriarchy has been real good to me but then one day i'm sexually harassed suddenly i am going to experience dissonance probably not only because there's a contradiction but because now i don't know what to do next like should i keep investing in my sort of patriarchal family structure or actually do I need to go become a feminist activist right um Mm. I'm sort of jumping very quickly into quite a complex political thing there but (laughs) a lot of the political contradictions that we encounter in the world challenge not just our sense of who we are as good people but also our sense of what on earth we should be doing next and Mm. um the the interesting thing about this is that it seems like by changing our bodily states we can in some way like I don't want to say hack into our system because that's really tech bro. But for example, people seem to experience less painful dissonance when they're lying down. And one of the reasons this is probably true, should it continue to replicate, um, is that it kind of turns off the immediate bit of our brain that's saying, we must make a decision now about what we're going to do next. And that makes the discomfort of the contradiction that we're noticing a little bit less intense. And maybe we can think about it for longer. Fascinating. So yeah, so I think our body, we should think about our body as part of our brain. Basically, a lot of people are beginning to understand that this is true. Our our body is doing some of the brain stuff for us. And when we change our body, we change what our brain is doing. And if we could be more aware of that as a society, it's possible there are more thinking possibilities for us. God, that is so interesting. So much in that. So much in that. But I mean, especially that, that, that one line of like, it challenge contradictions challenge what we should be doing next because yeah. this is because this is really the problem right how do i put this there are i mean i i have debates with um people quite frequently around this like i think people are quite quick to be like everybody now knows about climate change i'm like yeah, yeah i don't know <laughs> i don't i don't know i don't know if everybody now knows about climate change or everybody believes right. it or whatever but also like, there's lots of different ways of knowing something right? exactly exactly yeah but I would say, I, I, you know, I certainly encounter a huge percentage of the population that is well aware of climate change and has like the top three talking points, you know, 
um, like uh, COP emissions, uh, fossil fuels, uh, politics, um, and are concerned, are aware, are concerned, are still living their lives as if they have nothing else to give to the problem um, or it will resolve itself, even though they can talk about the fact that it's the problem is not resolving itself. I mean, I remember um, meeting a guy in Papua New Guinea who works for a recruiting company for Total Energy. And he was young, you know, he was in his late 20s. And I was like, what are you doing? Yeah. You're going to have hey. to live through this. What? He was like, and he said, well, if I don't do it, somebody else will. Yeah. And that kind of, you know, um, attitude is something that I see a lot. And, you know, it's the same one that I have, to, you know, occasionally I try and take trains everywhere. But occasionally when I do take a plane, I'm like, mm -hmm. I mean, the plane was already running anyway. So, but this idea of like, we can know, we can experience the contradiction and we can still do the thing, not just by like repressing our thoughts or not even by sort of deliberately constructing these like amazing rationalizations, but just possibly also because we don't know what to do next. We don't know what yeah. else to do. Well, exactly. Like that guy would definitely experience a real challenge to his affordances should he decide it's unacceptable to work for an energy company like that, right? Because mm. then what? Does he have to, now he's going to retrain? Or does he maybe even need to do something that actively fixes the thing that he has been contributing? You know, I mean, it's really rough um, in that sense. And that's part of why I'm, I'm writing a book for Bloomsbury. Um, and I have an entire chapter just on this uh, idea about action and how like, actually a lot of what it means to think is to do. And we don't have this idea very well in Western culture. So that's why we think that something like debate, we'll get to debate in one second, I know. Debate <laughs> is a great idea. And what we need to do for ideas is just debate them to the ends of the earth. And then we will truly know what we think. But actually, all the evidence we have about debate is that it does basically nothing in terms of changing people's minds or letting them think through new ideas. Um, if they are in the debate themselves, they like their own ideas more at the end. <laughs> uh, if they aren't watching it, their views are not very changed. And this is true across different countries. And yeah. Um, but it does turn out that when you try out new actions in the world, your views do change uh, a lot of the time. But this is a much more, let's say, effective way of trying to change your own mind about something. Like, you want to know if it's possible to, I don't know, live more sustainably? Try doing it and you will discover a new opinion about that fact, right? Um, hopefully you will discover it is possible. But regardless, you will change your mind because uh, in, in most cases, when we engage in new actions, our beliefs shift more or less in accordance with them and certainly in response to um, and so I think one of the things to, to bridge between this action thing and the debate thing that you want to talk about is just that thinking is often the secondary result of doing. And if we wanted to have a more thoughtful society, we'd be doing more, right? Oh, gosh, that, what a beautiful line. Um, although I would like to counter it and say also maybe if we had a more thoughtful society, part of that would just be doing less. <laughs> like I would like yeah. people doing, doing differently, let's say, <laughs> instead of doing, more. Di <laughs> doing differently. Yeah, like maybe we all need to lie down and have a little nap. <laughs> um, and then we'll think differently but <laughs> but yeah I think like the idea that we could just in the abstract on our own sitting in our little uh, unused bodies come up with new great ideas is pretty facile and it's more facile when it comes to politics and other things probably well on politics I know that your book is being published in 2025 but it is on debate don't talk about politics and what to do instead and it has a whole chapter on why debate is an unhelpful paradigm excellent I mean let's let's get into it um let's build on what you've um already said i mean why how does it relate to the self how is it threatening and um, what are some uh, forms of engaging with one another that are more helpful so the first question is why does debate not really work very well right yeah and yeah there are a couple of different reasons one of them is look basically it's a format that at least most of the time if you change your mind you're considered to have lost so mm -hmm. in a way it's already set up that people are going to be disincentivized to change their minds secondly when you are stating your views, you, you listen to yourself and you believe yourself. And whatever the other person says, you're listening to you and you believe your own views. And actually, mm -hmm. you believe your own views more the more you say them a lot of the time. So it's, it's an exercise set up to just hear your own point of view again if you're doing the debating. Um, and thirdly, I just think it's, again, one of the things I'm writing about in my book is that there are two things that do change our minds quite a bit. And they're belonging with new groups of people and trying out new actions in the world. Those things do change our views quite a lot. And debate doesn't involve either of them. And online debate involves somehow even less of them. <laughs> um, so yeah, when you look at the psychology research about what happens in debate and the sociology research about what happens in debate, there's very little evidence that it's doing anything to shift our views or even make them more complex, usually. 
Right. Okay. So possibly even simplifying them. Yeah. Right. Or then reinforcing them, let's say, mm. keeping them strongly where they were. God, I mean, you think about the fact that the Senate, you know, Houses of Parliament, all of this kind of stuff set up with people on two sides of the aisle shouting at each other as if that is somehow the most effective way to have a conversation. Um, and right. I think what's so sad about it is like if uh, to kind of try to try and join dots uh, here, yeah. it's like this, this sense of self that we expect these also non-entities to have like political parties and for people to represent and for that to be fixed. Um, and then to engage in an exercise which actually only perpetrates existing values rather than rather than having collaborative discussion on like, hey, what do we want to achieve here? Like, we all seem to be here for the same reason, right, guys? You know, we all we all want to help people, don't we? Isn't that why you're in politics? You know, maybe, 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 maybe. maybe. <laughs> and also maybe if we put our heads together. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we could come up with some more interesting results rather than sort of bashing our heads off of one another. And yet there seems to be like the, the main uh, barrier from getting there does seem to come back again to this idea of self again and of things being yeah. fixed and therefore of things being like trustworthy, even though things that are just to say things that are fixed in nature like the things that are not in motion the things that are not changing and not evolving those things are dead <laughs> there's only one fixed yeah. state in nature and it's dead yeah yeah if you're alive congratulations you're gonna keep drifting <laughs> and so there's something about you know this like i don't know the if we could somehow to pull a term from jacques Attali, if we could somehow think about things in the terms of like economy of life versus economy of death even though he was instrumental in creating the economy of death in Europe. Still a good phrase. Still a good phrase. This idea like the things that are transforming, that are in motion, that are in relationship, that are interdependent, that's all the economy of life because that is how the world works. And I said the world rather than the natural world because I had to pick myself up on that recently. <laughs> there is no binary there. Um, versus the economy of death, that is literally it is things that are fixed it is things that are unchanging and it's things that will not adapt and unfortunately that does seem to be the world that we live in and perhaps that is why it's so dependent on like these mechanical life support machines because it's not it's not alive in any good sense of the word yeah i think that's right i think um the irony maybe to our fear of death is that we've created a world that mimics it in some way right mm. it is very fixed and that we think is stable and actually is causing lots of death and so once again, we're stuck in a place where we don't want our own self to die, but lots of other stuff is dying all the time. That's very worrying. Yeah, but as you said, the planet can die. That's fine as long as yeah, I'm yeah, alive. as long as I'm I'm still here somehow. That seems because fine. I'll have my mechanical life support machine on Mars, keeping me alive. Like, come Great. on, guys! It's so, it's so obvious. Um, what is a way? Okay, so if debate doesn't work, and we can come back to the economy of death, but I'm conscious of the time. If debate doesn't work, what is an effective way of speaking to people and inviting them to into a more fluid brain space? Yeah, so I, I've been thinking about this a lot. I'm still working on it. But I guess um, to go back to those two things I mentioned, the two things I'm really interested in are the way that engaging in new actions seems to change people's mind about things and the way belonging in new groups of people changes people's mind about things. And there's so many different things that could involve either new activities or belonging in new groups of people, right? But um, I, one of the things I like to think about and like use as a broad term for what we need is infrastructure. Firstly, because I think we need infrastructure in general. And I know you've had podcast guests about infrastructure and infrastructure is mm. good infrastructure. <clears throat> it's so important and it creates these massive shifts that we could never do as like individual moralists. And yeah. Um, but also, I mean, infrastructure, both in the literal sense that infrastructure is often the thing that changes where we go during the day yeah. and who we belong with right um and you know that's very important but it also anything that is invisible but subtly shifts the way we behave and infrastructure does this constantly like the way i travel around in the world is based on london tfl and you know mm -hmm. the place i live is based on a complex series of infrastructure investments that led to the housing market as it is and where my office is and who i see when i go to work is based on that too and um and so sociologists have come up with this term called social infrastructure. And they, by this, they mean basically pieces of infrastructure that lead to social ties um, and social capital is another word they often use, which is a complex mm -hmm. term, or social contact. Um, and it changes 
it changes who we belong with and who we talk to and who we know. Um, one of the more famous studies about social infrastructure showed that in communities that were poor and in Chicago, but had some social infrastructure, places people could basically be together for relatively cheap or nothing at all, like public parks and basketball, you know, uh, courts and barbershops and whatever. Those places dealt way better with heat waves and many fewer people died. And the reason is simply that they knew each other, right? So you knew the old guy and you went and checked in on him and you made sure he had water and you took him to the hospital and whatever. Um, and that's very interesting when it comes to climate change. Because it suggests that one of the ways that we can be resilient in terms of disasters is building infrastructure that connects people to their neighbors so they can take care of each other. If you don't know the person, you never go save them, right? I mean, maybe not, but often we don't. We don't even know they exist. Even if we are moral yeah. people, we're not sure who to check in on. Yeah. Uh, but at a broader level, it's likely that having social infrastructure, which can often be built in quite subtle ways, like it can be built by having parents have a room in the school they can go to and hang out in when they're waiting for their kid to be done with sports yeah. or whatever, you know, and then the parents all know each other. Um, I'm very interested in social infrastructure because I think, well, I know that it changes the groups of people that we feel ourselves to belong with. And that in turn can change our point of view about a lot of different things. It leads to the kinds of open-ended conversations that in some cases are a bit like the deep canvassing conversations that have been shown to change people's views um, in the long run about political issues because they are like long form, non-judgmental, non-debatey um, storytelling operations where each person gets to try out what it's like to be the other person while without feeling judged. And also it makes us feel like our actions matter in that community, that there are people who are going to be changed by them. It, it exposes us to new ideas. You know, so anyway, I'm very, very interested in this kind of social infrastructure um, and to anything more broadly that helps us belong with new groups of people and try out new actions. Excellent. I love that. I was writing recently about how, um, or a few months ago, about how infrastructure can we can think of infrastructure as like the decimulacra that like reveals a new way of being in the world and i love that yeah in terms perfect of like social yeah infrastructure oh, as a well. good baudrillard yeah. reference yeah thank you very much just dropping mm. it in there <laughs> my love only baudrillard. baudrillard reference you said um it's like the space for like non-debating non-judgmental storytelling and that is linked to deep canvassing um yeah yeah could you talk about that so please? Great. So one of the things that I, in my PhD research, look at is this thing called deep canvassing, which is a, a very strategic form of like interaction developed in large part by people who are advocating for marriage equality. They looked at a bunch of psychology research, including some stuff on cognitive dissonance, and they developed a technique where you go to the person and you say, look, what is your view on this? And you give them a scale from zero to 10, you know, where zero is like no gay people should ever get married or be gay. And 10 is, yeah, great, marriage equality. Um, and, and then the person would say something and maybe they'd say, you know, oh, I guess I'm a two. I mean, I don't really think this is how it should work, whatever. Um, and then the deep canvasser says, oh, well, can you tell me why you're at two? And actually, in some cases, they say, can you tell me why you're at two and not at zero? Which is very clever because it means that they're getting the other person to state the reason they might be in favor of marriage equality mm. a little bit. And then they can pull on those reasons. Right. Um, but in any case, then there's usually a non-judgmental exchange of stories. Um, where you might listen to their stories about why they're hesitant about marriage equality, and then you would share your own reasons why you think, just you as a person, that marriage equality is a good idea. You might talk about your gay friends. You might talk about the importance of marriage in your life. You might talk about discrimination. You might even ask them some sort of empathy-building questions, like, have you ever felt discriminated against? And then usually at the end of the conversation, you just ask them again where they stand. And these conversations seem to be not only effective in the minute at changing people's mind, they'll often come back and say, oh, actually put me at like a five, you know, or oh, uh, I don't know, seven, right? People change their views, but also they seem to last. So when people went back three months later and asked the same people where they stood on marriage equality, and now this is often used for trans rights and for immigration, uh, people's view shift seems to stick. And there are probably a couple of different mechanisms at work during this process. Um, one of them is the non-judgment that the more that one can appear non-judgmental about what the other person has to say, the more it is uh, possible for their sense of self to shift, right? Because they're not mm -hmm. defending their sense of self in the first place. Um, it also means you're not triggering what psychologists call reactance, which is where you're saying, screw you, don't tell me what to think. I'm myself. I have a sense of agency. You can't make me do anything. Which is pretty stubbornly in the heads of most people. Um, and also it's letting there be ambiguity, right? Because it's saying, okay, from zero to 10, you're somewhere in the middle. You're not a zero. You're not a 10. And maybe your sense of self isn't that fixed in that way as you might have thought. 
And also the story exchange seems to do a lot. And um, apparently one of the reasons is because you can't really argue with someone's story. You know, if you tell me, Sarah, this happened to me. I mean, only truly weird conversations allow for me to say, no, that didn't happen to you. And so that seems to do a lot of work as well. So there's a lot of things going on in conversations like that. But it's really difficult to have a conversation like that without A, understanding a little bit about why they work and B, having long form periods of time where you belong with someone else and you're going to have a real deep conversation about something. So I'm interested in making spaces where people can have those conversations and we're, are likely to anyway, because they're going to be there. That is excellent. I suppose the next, apart from like door knocking, and I, I guess this social infrastructure as well of parents, you know, like quite a homogenous group, but I bet with like a very heterogeneous, you know, set of people within it. Yeah. Um, or I just, yeah, I just wonder how, like, how do we, how do we get the people allegedly making decisions? And they're not, right? They're just following. Um, but I'm talking about leaders in the world. How do we get those people into the spaces of social infrastructure to like have a bloody chat about what's going on? And get them to figure out that um, if the planet dies, their sense of self is also going to die because they're bodily going to die. Gosh, I mean, I think it's, I don't know. I, what do I think? <laughs> I think the tricky thing about actual politicians is that they are stuck in a very specific power structure, right? They have their funders mm -hmm. and their donors and their team and their this and their that. And they are mainly responsible to like polls and funders. And so... If I were to devise a political strategy, I mostly wouldn't start there. I think that the world is very actually unforgiving to politicians mm -hmm. who can rarely change their mind and, without receiving huge backlash. Um, and it's one of the reasons I'm so committed to researching this stuff is that I think actually what we have to do is first change like average people's mind mm -hmm. <laughs> or really the small strip of people that are persuadable is, is truly where the political work is done and the politicians sort of follow from there. And to the degree that they don't, they probably can't be persuaded by having a long-form conversation because the reason they're not persuadable is either um, that they, they actually are happy with the way the world is going or uh, that they have to be happy with the way the world is going because that's what's in their financial interests. Uh, so, sorry, that's a long-form way of saying, like, I don't know that we can do it by changing the minds of people who are in power. I think, I don't know, might might be a little bit of a Democrat, after all, despite my <laughs> Marxist leanings, you know, I think we have to change normal people's minds and go from there. I don't know. I don't know if changing normal people's minds would have an impact on the sense of direction, given just yeah. this, you know, I increasing you descent into fascism. I mean, I'm very happy for there to be like a, a team that goes and just tries to, you know, make, I don't know, Rishi Sunak wake up in a sweat in the middle of the night. Like that's, that's <laughs> valid work, too. But I, yeah. Um, I love that. I love the, you know, like um, in America, SWATs. We could call it SWATs. Yeah, a little like SWAT team sweats. to like annoy yeah. Rishi. Yeah. The SWAT SWATs. There's a lot of uh, hope in it, obviously, because the more that we understand our own psychology and our psychology within groups, the more that we can kind of like, to use a tech term, hack it. Um, yeah. But yeah, this, I think this thing about social infrastructure is so interesting because if you can't get to certain people in order, like, and, and those people are having lots of conversations between them in echo chambers and unfortunately whether it's like you know um owners of newspapers and politicians and corporations and lobbyists like those who have totally inequitable distributions of power they are having conversations that impact the decisions that they make and are further sort of cementing their views which perhaps could be an explanation as to why they keep doubling down on madness yeah. um in the face no, of i mean evidence. you're right actually that if we could make politicians belong in different groups somehow that might change their views because that seems to be what humans do. They join a new group of people and they shift their views. The question mm -hmm. is like, who are those people that we're going to get, you know, yeah. yeah, get them to belong with? I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They'd have to, yeah. Which group wants to invite politicians in after this recent haul? Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure there'd be some kind souls, some kind souls out there that should be politicians that'd be willing Let's to do so. that work. Just hang out with them for a while. Look. Um, yeah. Without killing them. Sarah, yep. this has been so fascinating. I, we, I feel like I could speak to you all day. Um, but I think we've covered, I think we've definitely covered enough to make people go and read up more about your work. Where should people go, actually, to find more about your work before Great. the book is out? Yeah, okay, so that book won't be out for a bit. In fact, I think you're the first podcast I've talked about it on, so congratulations. Exciting. Uh, don't tell my publisher. I'm not sure I'm supposed to do this. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I actually already have a publication in a book from a small press called Perspectiva Press. The book is called Dispatches from a Time Between Worlds, 
Crisis and Emergence in Meta Modernity. And it has all these essays, and mine is one of them. So if you want a little book for your book club, there you go. And then hopefully in a year and a half, there'll be another book. Hopefully. So. I can't wait to read it. Um, my final question for you, Sarah, is who would yeah. you like to platform? I'm currently working with 25 students uh, with my co-host of a course uh, whose name is Max Haven. And Max and I are kind of going through a lot of the stuff you and I just talked about on this podcast um, with our students who are, students is not really the right word for this. We're like convening a thing and giving them some readings, but also ultimately it's for them to sort stuff out, right? <laughs> um, and And the people in this program are being asked to come up with like, solutions for the world um wow. and some of them are interested in sort of fighting the far right and some of them are interested in uh, you know preventing transphobia or reducing transphobia so i guess rather than give one exact person i would just say that i think i'm really curious what the people in our program are going to do and i want one of them to come on your podcast once they've done some of it like in a Excellent. year I want, yeah i want one yeah. of them to uh, they'll have done a little bit of activism and i think it would then be really interesting to see how they used all these slightly abstracted concepts I just used, but for real and did something real with it, because I think that's important and um, in some ways more inspiring than any idea on its own can be. What a great idea. Thank you so much. I look forward yeah. to it. This is such a pleasure, Rachel. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much for your time. You too. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together. 